Thanks, Chris. Let's just pray. Uh, Lord, we just uh, commit this time to you. We, we pray that, uh, uh, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable to you as we, as we study your word this, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, there's some passages in, in Scripture that you just enjoy more than others, and I think that this is one of those passages that I really uh, love. Uh, I'm struck by the contrast, the contrast between the woman and uh, Judas and the chief priest, uh, and, and the importance that they place or don't place on Jesus. Uh, one of them is, is uh, the woman is, is, is prepared to make uh, this enormous sacrifice for Jesus while the others are, are prepared to betray Jesus uh, for a mere 30 pieces of silver. And, and as you think about this uh, passage, I think, uh, I wonder what we're prepared to give up for Jesus. What are we prepared to give up for Jesus? I wonder whether we're willing to do as this woman has done. This passage begins with uh, uh, Jesus again saying that within a couple of days that he will die on a cross. Uh, uh, this sort of sets the scene. And then we have this incident of, of this woman who, who comes with uh, and anoints Jesus' uh, head, which is an odd thing to do, I think, um, with very expensive perfume. And then lastly, we have Judas going off uh, to the authorities and offering to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, these scenes are obviously uh, linked by that common thread, Jesus' death. And I want to mention uh, just three things this morning. Firstly, God's sovereignty. Secondly, money. And thirdly, um, our devotion to Christ. So firstly, uh, God's sovereignty, verses uh, 1 to uh, five. Here in this passage, we see the, the glorious sort of providence and sovereignty of God. And in fact, all the way through Matthew's gospel, we see this coming through. Jesus showing that his coming was all the work and the plan of God. We see it in the fulfillment of of uh, the scriptures that are mentioned. His salvation coming to pass as it had been planned, as we see through the Old Testament into the New Testament. And here we see that, that Jesus knows that he must die at the feast of the Passover, a feast that was uh, uh, to remember how Israel had been delivered from slavery uh, at the hands of the Egyptians. And when a sort of Passover lamb had to be killed by every household that they might uh, be delivered from the judgment of God. It had always been God's plan that Jesus would die as the, as the greater Paschal lamb, that he would completely deliver his people uh, from death and judgment, and that he would rescue them from a much greater slavery than the Egypt from the Egyptians. Jesus was to be the one who would deliver the people from the power of sin and from Satan's dominion uh, of darkness. And it was also uh, God's plan that he would rise again uh, on uh, the day of first fruits, uh, which was always the first Sunday after Passover, so that he could be the new first fruit of the new creation. There would be absolutely no room for mistaking what Jesus did and what he achieved. But of course, the Jewish leaders knew nothing of this, did they? For reasons all of their own, they had decided to kill uh, Jesus, and they wanted to kill Jesus at the earliest possible time after the Passover. Look at verses 3 to 5. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered, and the, 
palace of the high priest whose name was Caiaphas and, and plotted together in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Well, maybe these chief priests and elders thought there was just too many people in Jerusalem at this time and, and they didn't want to make a scene. You see, thousands of pilgrims would, be, would have been flocking into Jerusalem at this time. Uh, maybe they, they knew that there would be lots of Galileans amongst them. And of course, Jesus came from Galilee. And of course, uh, as I said last week, this was a volatile time. Uprisings often occurred at this time. People were very patriotic. They did not like uh, the, 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 the Romans occupying them. So they didn't want to stir up dissension. So they planned to leave it for another time. Uh, a, a little time after the Passover when not so many people were around. However, God's plans will be fulfilled regardless of the authority. An arrest and a trial on, on a nondescript date didn't fit into God's a grand plan. So uh, another evil man enters the scene and he offers to betray Jesus. In fact, this is one of Jesus' close followers. He, he offers for a small price to betray Jesus. And so God's grand plan comes into action through the actions of evil men. Imagine that. You see, Judas, who, who knew Jesus' movements, who, who knew what Jesus would be up to, could, could lead them to Jesus. He knew where Jesus would be. He knew uh, the places that Jesus uh, could be arrested uh, quietly. And of course, that's exactly what happened, isn't it? Uh, Judas does lead them to Jesus in this quiet spot in the garden uh, one evening, and so Jesus is arrested and taken off to trial and to die. I want to say that God's providence and plans are so large and so effective that even evil plans and evil actions of men uh, are used to bring about every detail in his ultimate good purposes. How he does it is beyond us, isn't it? I do not understand it, but it's truly wonderful to know that God has such exalted powers. Uh, it's wonderful to know that God is in control despite the evil that we see around us. You see, it's, it's not just for Jesus that he does this, but it's for you and me as well. Look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. You see that this is for us as well. God working for good through our circumstances, achieving his purposes in our lives. You might be going through some rough time at the moment, uh, that evil uh, people might be oppressing you. You might uh, think that things are getting on top of you and you are uh, just struggling to cope. You might have just heard that you have some terminal illness, maybe cancer. You might have lost a, a, a loved one. You might have fallen on financially hard times. You might be struggling with your marriage or with, with uh, family matters. Believe me, God is working for good in your life. He's working for good in your life, working his purposes out in your life. God's power and promises to uh, turn it uh, for your good and for his glory. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Whatever circumstance you're facing, they are nothing compared with what we see in this passage. If God can, uh, could turn to, uh, to good the, the evil of the chief priest, the evil of Judas, he can certainly do the same for your situation. God working for good. God is sovereign. Let us never forget that. God is sovereign. 
As John Piper says, your sufferings are not meaningless. God is working for good in your lives and for his glory, and we have to hold on to that and believe that. Honestly, it's the thing that has uh, encouraged and kept an elder and I as an elder has faced her difficulties. God is sovereign. Secondly, we have this idea of money here. You see, this passage also shows dramatically the different attitudes to money. The woman at the dinner pours an entire uh, bottle of, of expensive perfume over Jesus' head. And then we have Judas who betrays Jesus for a mere 30 pieces of silver. We're told in the other gospel accounts that the woman was Mary. She was the sister of Lazarus and, and that the perfume was worth a, a year's wages to the average person. Uh, so that would be like someone today pouring out, say, between fifty and $70,000 worth of perfume over the head of this bloke. On the other hand, the 30 pieces of silver were probably the silver coins at the temple. Uh, I, at the time, each one of these was worth uh, 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 twice the daily wage. So to betray Jesus, Judas receives a, a couple of months' wages. That, that is all. Two months' wages to betray Jesus. It is the same price paid for a slave in those days. So that you can see the dramatic difference between what Mary did and what Judas did. The woman was ready to use up what was worth a, a year's wages to, to make Jesus smell nice, whereas Judas was willing to receive two months' wages in order to commit the ultimate crime. You know, these actions, I think, shine a light on our attitude to money and possessions. You know, by, by any uh, measure, the woman's actions are extravagant, aren't they? Uh, whether you uh, care about careful stewardship or whether you care about social justice or whether you care about being prudent, this action seems to make little sense, does it? Surely this money could have been invested in kingdom causes. Put it into a trust where you can train up leaders for ministry. Uh, perhaps the perfume could have been saved for a wedding day or, or when uh, she was mixing with important people at social events. Uh, perhaps the perfume could have been sold and the money put away for a rainy day or, or they could have done what the disciples suggested in verse 9. This money could have been given to the poor. Imagine. Imagine for a moment how many people you could... Uh, feed uh, with this money. Uh, think of the widows and orphans that could have been fed with this money. It seems such a waste. Such a waste. And look at Judas, uh, both in Matthew and Mark, we have Judas uh, going immediately after this to the chief priests and, and betraying Jesus. In John's Gospel, we have Judas protesting the loudest at the actions of this woman. And, and we're told that his protesting is not because he's concerned for the poor, but rather he wants some money for himself because he's been stealing from the communal money purse. In fact, uh, Judas, I think, he loved money so much that he helped himself to ministry funds. Can you imagine how he felt as he watched Mary pour this expensive perfume over, over Jesus' head? Uh, the anger, the disdain that he must have felt uh, uh, toward this woman and, and to Jesus who allowed this woman to do it. He must have been so angry. So much so that he goes off to the priest and he offers to betray Jesus. Have you any idea what would drive a man to do something like that? 
where the hunger for money comes from. That hurt, that desire, when you see money wasted like that, makes you want to put an end to it and makes you itch to to want to get your hands on it. You know, for some it comes from insecurity. Uh, Perhaps you grew up in a home that never had quite enough and your parents were always worried about money and, and you're always in struggle street. Perhaps uh, uh, money makes you feel safe, that you can support yourself if you need to. For others, that desire comes from envy. You, you watch others uh, who seem to have everything, that nice house, that good job, the, the nice car. They go on fantastic holidays. They seem so comfortable compared with you who long to have that same lifestyle. I know at times I felt like that. Wishing that I had more money. Wishing that I could keep up with the Joneses. For some it's just straight out greed, I think, that causes them to uh, be like that. That desire for power. That desire for control. To be in control of your own destiny. We don't know what motivated Judas. However, we do know that it wasn't the poor. It doesn't seem that Judas had any grievances against Jesus. Uh, We're not told uh, of it anyway, but even if he did, the fact is that he betrayed Jesus for money. He betrayed Jesus for money. Uh, Look at verse 14 and 15. Judas, Judas specifically asks for money to betray Jesus. Look what it says. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and says, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? Judas is consumed with money. He hates the fact that expensive perfume has been poured over Jesus' head and and he races off to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. What about you? Is there a hunger and drive for money in you? And where does it come from? I know that for myself, a desire for a better lifestyle, this is what sometimes drives me. I sometimes think that if only I had that amount of money, I, uh, I wouldn't have to worry anymore. Life would be so much better. Or that I'd be able to solve uh, uh, all my problems or solve other people's problems as well. You see, money is such an issue within our society, isn't it? Uh, The pursuit of a nice house, a better car, a boat, etc., etc., etc. It can consume us. It can take us away from the Lord. I wonder how many of us are enslaved by our mortgages. I wonder if it does that for you. You see, the love of money is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money. Which leads me to my third point, our devotion to Jesus. Ultimately, you see, The behavior in this passage comes down to people's attitude to Jesus. Uh, The chief priests hated Jesus and would have done and would do just anything to get rid of him. Mary loved Jesus and would do anything to honor him. And Judas, well, he doesn't seem to value Jesus much at all, even at all. Why would anyone want to hate Jesus? Lots of people out there hate Jesus. 
I think the chief priests give us a reason. The chief priests and, and elders have been shown up time and time again in the Gospels. Jesus has told them directly and indirectly just how wicked and how hypocritical they, they are. When all the time they have convinced themselves just how good they are, how wonderful they are. You see, Jesus threatened their identity uh, and, and what they thought about themselves, and they could not stand what Jesus had said. Isn't that like the people out there? They don't want to be told they're sinners. Jesus had also threatened their position, their, their power, their prestige, their wealth. They, they, they were at the top, and, and no way were they going to be moved. They valued their position more than God himself. The fact that they hated Jesus and wanted to kill him just shows their true heart attitude to God, and it shows up through this passage, doesn't it? And I want to suggest that many people out there think similarly. Your response to Jesus shows your true heart attitude to God. It's your attitude to Jesus and, and not what others think that's an important here. And of course, this is what we uh, see in Mary as she anoints Jesus' head with perfume. She loves him so much that she would pour out such expensive perfume in what seems just a, a momentary honoring of Christ. She isn't thinking about helping the poor. She isn't thinking about herself and her own needs. She isn't thinking about kingdom work, whatever that might be. She's thinking about Christ. She wants to make much of him. She wants him to be glorified. She wants him to be, be exalted above everyone. What is $50,000 for a chance to glorify her king? What a magnificent attitude. So different from the, the chief priests and elders. No wonder Jesus commands her in verses 12 and 13, in pouring out the ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the, in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. We're remembering her today, aren't we? Still speaking about it, still admiring her actions. For Judas, this attitude is incomprehensible. Perhaps Jesus was to him a, a, a friend and a, a teacher, but to value him more than things of this world, to focus everything on him rather than yourself, seems so foolish to him. Incomprehensible. Be besides, you needed to look after number one, and that's what Judas was thinking. And this is what Judas tried to do. Look after number one. He was, he was not going to go along with the foolishness of this, this silly woman who pours out this perfume on, the, on Jesus' head. Neither was he prepared to commit himself to Jesus if this is what he allowed to happen. And in a sense, we can all be a bit like Judas at times. Perhaps not betray Jesus to the cross, but we want to look after number one, don't we? Uh, we can say, we will follow him, or we can uh, take note of his teachings and even try to apply it where it's not too difficult. But in our day-to-day -day lives, who are we living for? What is our devotion and effort put into it? Is it that promotion at work, or is it that money in the bank, or is it getting the mortgage paid off, or is it avoiding that uncomfortable situation? 
What we do is what Mary did. Pour an expensive bottle of perfume on Jesus in an instant without any thought. Would you lose it all in, in a fragrant offering to him for his glory? We cannot serve God and mammon or God and money. We cannot serve two masters. It, it may seem to work for a while. Indeed, uh, Judas had followed Jesus for a, a whole three years without ever losing his heart for money. But in the end, the deepest devotion of your heart will always show itself as it does here. Are we really all for Jesus? If not, there's a chance that one day you will discover that you are not at all for Jesus. Which one of these examples uh, best described you or a part of you? Uh, do you care about good causes so much that you lose sight of, of honoring Christ? Do you find Christ's words and actions so aggravating and convicting that you really just want to get rid of them? Do you try to convince yourself that you're following Jesus, but you know there are areas in your life that are still being lived for yourself? Or are you like this lady who was ready and willing to pour out everything? who extravagantly worships, who does all she can to see Jesus made much of. I think that there are many of us who struggle to be like this woman. I know I do. To show the same heartfelt devotion that this woman felt. Well, I have good news for you this morning. Jesus is able to help us. His mercy and grace is able to draw us in. His mercy and grace is able to forgive and restore us if, if we are not right with him and, and put us back on the right track. On the cross, Jesus died for sinners such as ourselves. On the cross, he died for, for broken sinners. You know, later on in this chapter, uh, Jesus tells the disciples that they would all fall away. And then a few verses later, we, we have Peter denying uh, Jesus three times. But that's not the end, because on the cross, Jesus dies for them. And in chapter 21 of John 21, uh, chapter 21 of, chap of John, we see how Jesus restores people, Peter and commissions him to be his disciple and to lead his church in worldwide mission. Here, Matthew and Jesus leave us this example, this example of this woman to remind us that our first love is always to Jesus. We're to give up everything for him. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this magnificent passage and the challenge it is to each of us here this morning. And we would pray that as we reflect on this passage today, that you might stir our hearts and help us to show the, the same devotion to you, Lord Jesus, as this woman did. That we might love you at any cost. In Jesus' name, amen.